Now, I know you wouldn't think it to look at me, but I was actually born in 1969. Back then, the global human population numbered about 3.6 billion, and learned scholars of the day were already warning that we'd reached the maximum sustainable population size. Today, that number has more than doubled, and according to the United Nations, it's projected to hit more than 9 billion in 2050, by which time, about 70% of all the humans on the planet will be living in cities. Here's a useless factoid for you. By mid-century, there'll be more people living in the city of Mumbai than in the whole of Canada. And that population growth and mass migration of people will bring many challenges, not least how to feed everyone without completely destroying what's left of the planet's increasingly fragile soil. One of the solutions that's been in and out of the news for about a decade now is to stop tearing down forests to grow crops outwards across an ever-expanding area of land and start growing upwards instead. As you've probably gathered by the title of the video, it's a practice called vertical farming, and the first large-scale operation was opened at this facility called Sky Greens in Singapore back in 2011. The industry is not without its sceptics though. It's regarded by some as a vastly expensive, energy-intensive pipe dream. But others point out that the exponential advances in green technologies, coupled with the massive cost reductions, make those claims less relevant in the 2020s. And in the last couple of years, vertical farming has started to grow extremely rapidly indeed if you'll forgive the pun. So will it work? Hello, and welcome to Just Have a Think. Most of the food that we eat in urban environments will likely have been delivered from vast distances via sea, air, road and rail, all of which adds to the burden of carbon dioxide emissions into our atmosphere. In the United States, the average food item travels about 1,500 miles before it reaches the plate. So growing that produce locally, indoors, in buildings with relatively small footprints, does seem like a very compelling idea. Essentially, the vertical farm system is based on hydroponics, which is the technique of growing plants without soil. Instead, the plant roots are submerged in liquid solutions containing all the nutrients they need, including nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. That means the plants can be grown in trays that can be stacked up on shelving systems in industrial units where special lights shine down 24 hours a day and carbon dioxide levels are carefully controlled in the enclosed airspace to ensure photosynthesis happens right around the clock. And because there's no soil in the system and the growing spaces are hermetically sealed, there's no need to use toxic pesticides to fight off predatory bugs because those bugs simply don't exist inside the building. Hydroponic systems reduce water use by about 90% compared to traditional soil farming and vastly reduce the area of land required for a given yield. This new startup in San Francisco, for example, run by a company called Plenty, reckons to harvest the same quantity of produce from its two acre site as you'd get from a traditional farm taking up 720 acres of land. An even more futuristic growing system called aeroponics is also gaining some traction in the industry. It was originally developed by NASA as an efficient way to grow plants in space. Instead of embedding plants into a nutrient-rich liquid solution, that solution is pumped as a mist into special air chambers where plants are suspended. Aeroponic systems aren't widely used in vertical farming just yet, but they are certainly attracting a lot of attention. And in fact, the technique is already being used by a US company called AeroFarms. They operate some of the largest vertical farms in the world, like this 6,500 square meter converted steel mill in Newark, New Jersey, producing a thousand tons of greens every year. And AeroFarms recently announced plans to build a 14,000 square meter state-of-the-art facility in Danville, Virginia, which will more than double that production volume. Reducing land and water use aren't the only benefits of vertical farming either. By its very nature, the process is extremely reliable compared to traditional agriculture. There's no seasonality in the weather conditions, so you get consistent crop production all year round, with vastly reduced harvesting time and with no compromise in flavour or quality. And of course, there's no requirement for the old-fashioned back-breaking labour-intensive farming practices or huge agricultural machinery currently needed to produce our crops today. It's not all rosy in the vertical farming garden though. The industry does face major challenges, predominantly in setup costs and energy consumption. As I mentioned earlier, one of the major criticisms 
is that these facilities use huge amounts of electricity to provide all that artificial ultraviolet light and a great deal of power to run all the plumbing and climate control systems. This 2018 essay by Dr Jonathan Foley, who's a world-renowned environmental scientist and executive director of Project Drawdown, argued that powering these systems on a worldwide scale could use even more energy than our existing high emissions food industry does today. These are perfectly reasonable concerns and operators should surely be mindful of the pitfalls, not least the fact that if all the energy for these facilities was being provided by fossil fuels, then it would undoubtedly have a major detrimental impact on our climate. But LED lighting efficiency has improved remarkably even in the last couple of years, while the cost of renewable technologies like solar and wind continue to tumble like they've just fallen off a cliff. This huge new warehouse in Copenhagen, Denmark, is run jointly by the Yes Health Group and Nordic Harvest. It's a 7,000 square meter hall housing 14 shelving levels of aluminium boxes stacked full of produce. It's fully automated with robots moving the boxes to optimise crop positioning and algorithms controlling nutrient balance, light availability and carbon dioxide levels. 20,000 specialised LED lights are installed here, all of which are powered by renewable energy from Denmark's extensive wind farms. Once it's fully operational, the facility will have a similar output to Aerofarm's New Jersey operation at 1,000 tonnes of produce a year. The other site we briefly looked at earlier, run by Plenty in San Francisco, adds artificial intelligence-based software to the automated robots to improve efficiencies still further. And they also use 100% renewable energy to power their systems. As a relatively new startup company, Plenty has attracted plenty of attention, having already received $400 million of capital from investors including SoftBank, former Google chairman Eric Schmidt, and Amazon's Jeff Bezos. And they've struck a deal with Albertsons stores in California to supply 430 stores with fresh produce. On a smaller scale, imaginative pioneers are putting hydroponic systems into underground tunnels and vaults, or even mine shafts, where the temperature and humidity are already quite warm and constant, which means less energy is needed to maintain the right atmospheric conditions. Even recycled shipping containers are being put to use for the purpose. In fact, they're becoming a very popular low-cost option that have the advantage of being ready-made, standardised, modular chambers that can be easily fitted out with LED lighting, hydroponic racking and smart climate control systems. Fast turn crops like these are most commonly used in vertical farming, but companies like Plenty are working hard on including fruit and vegetables into their production. Their CEO, Matt Barnard, says our goal is to fit perishable produce into as many people's budgets as possible. Year after year, more and more fresh fruit and vegetable production will be localised. More people will be able to eat fresh fruit and vegetables than ever before, and those people will be amazed at how great those fruit and vegetables taste. And as more research is carried out, so more and more options are being explored. One of those options is aquaponics, which essentially combines plant growing with fish farming. Fish tanks produce nutrient-rich wastewater, which gets filtered and treated to convert ammonia into nitrates that the plants can use. As they absorb the nutrients in the water, the plants purify it so it can be fed back into the fish tanks. And the crops use the carbon dioxide produced by the fish too. The water in the fish tank retains heat and helps the greenhouse maintain temperature at night to save energy. They're not widely used yet, but they could certainly represent a potential solution for the future as we move away from our reliance on land and water intensive red meat and poultry for our protein. One foodstuff that has until recently been regarded as a complete non-starter for vertical farming though is cereal crops like wheat, maize and rice. And that's a great shame because the vast swathes of land currently being used to produce these staples of our diet are mostly found in the very regions of the world that are at the severest risk from climate change. And given that these crops provide more than half of all the calories consumed by human beings today, that means we could be looking at an existential food crisis by mid-century. But this latest research, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in August 2020, has demonstrated that wheat can be grown using vertical farming techniques. And if that turns out to be verifiable in a commercial setting, then it really would be a game changer. Wheat is the most widely grown crop in the world, making up about 20% of all the calories and protein we humans eat. The researchers created two growth simulation models 
of a 10 layer vertical farm with optimal artificial light, temperatures and carbon dioxide levels. In that environment, they found that the setup could yield as much as 1940 metric tons of wheat per hectare of land per year. And that's a massive increase on traditional wheat farming, which manages just 3.2 tons per hectare. As always, of course, someone will need to stump up some serious cash and take the financial risk of trying to make this theoretical simulation actually work commercially in practice. But let's face it, that's what entrepreneurs do every day, isn't it? And the investor that nails this one will find themselves with a very lucrative enterprise on their hands. In the meantime, vertical farming continues to go from strength to strength. Facilities are cropping up all the time, not just in the United States and Europe, but pretty much anywhere in the world where there are large expanding urban centers. These facilities are all very impressive, but I don't think anyone is trying to pretend that vertical farming on its own will come anywhere near to solving the dual crises of food scarcity and soil degradation that loom large as we approach 2050. Nevertheless though, as our way of life becomes increasingly more urbanized and more and more people move away from their dependence on meat and towards plant-based diets, these new city-based fresh food factories look set to become an increasingly commonplace element in our everyday lives. No doubt you've got your own views on the subject or perhaps even some experience of working with these systems. If so, then jump down to the comment section below and leave your thoughts there. That's it for this week though. Thanks to our fantastic Patreon supporters who help keep the channel independent and keep these videos ad free. And a quick shout out to the folks who've joined since last time with pledges of $10 or more a month. They are Mike Dewey, Jeff Lang, David Haro, Brett Bond, Mikhail Jonsson, Andrew Aikman, Gonzalo Rafat, and Andrew Mutziger. And of course, a big thank you to everyone else who's joined since last time too. You can support the channel and receive exclusive monthly news updates from me, plus the chance to have your say on future programs in monthly content polls by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And of course, you can hugely support the channel absolutely for free by subscribing and hitting that like button. And if you want to be notified about new content each week, make sure you hit that little bell icon too. Subscribing couldn't be easier. You just need to click down there or on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week and remember to just have a think. See you next week.